In this video, we're going to discuss a chronic disease known as type 2 diabetes, which involves impaired control of blood glucose. We're going to describe both the prevalence and trends in diabetes rates, both in America and worldwide. We're going to talk about some of the devastating complications that are connected with diabetes. We're going to explain the relationship between obesity rates and diabetes rates and how that can vary across different populations. We're then going to talk about the pathology by which diabetes occurs and how insulin secretion, insulin resistance are connected as diabetes progresses. Finally, we'll talk about the key role of the pancreatic beta cell in understanding the genetic risk of type 2 diabetes. About 10% of American adults have type 2 diabetes, and about 88 million American adults have what's known as prediabetes, which is between normal glycemia and diabetes. Many of these people who have prediabetes eventually transition to having diabetes. As we'll discuss, diabetes is highly connected to obesity. It's estimated to be somewhere between 20 and 80% heritable. If you look at twin studies, there's about 70% concordance in diabetes rates between monozygotic twins, suggesting a very strong genetic component. Socioeconomically, there's a much higher prevalence of diabetes in America in Black, Latino, Native American, and Pacific Islander populations. If we look at diabetes rates over the last 50 or 60 years, you can see there was a slow but linear increase from about 1960 to about 2000. But as obesity rates have skyrocketed since around the year 2000, diabetes rates have increased in tandem. There are several important complications of diabetes. For example, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in most adults. Nephropathy, which is kidney disease, about 30 to 40% of all diabetics have some kind of symptomatic chronic kidney disease. Neuropathy is damage of nerves, sensory neurons. The risk of amputation is 25 times higher in people with diabetes compared to people without diabetes. And cardiovascular disease. The risk of heart attack or stroke is somewhere between two and four-fold higher in individuals with diabetes compared to those without. The elevated chronic increase in blood glucose can affect almost every organ system in the body, often to very devastating consequences. Let's look at how obesity connects with diabetes. Here, we're looking at obesity as measured by the body mass index and how it relates to diabetes risk in both men and women. Women tend to have a higher diabetes risk overall than men. But if we take the relative risk at somebody who has a BMI of 35 and we'll compare it to somebody who is normal weight at a BMI of 25, you can see there's either an 11 or 19 fold increased risk between somebody who is at BMI of 25 and somebody who we would say is at class two obesity, which is a BMI of 35 or higher. Another way to look at this is look at the incidence of diabetes and obesity by geography. Shown here are two graphs provided by the CDC. You can see obesity rates broken down by county with red counties on the left having higher obesity rates. In the graph on the right, you can see diabetes rates by county. Again, red indicating higher diabetes rates. You can see geographically, the regions that have higher incidence of obesity also have higher incidence of diabetes. There are several important disparities that we need to consider with respect to obesity and diabetes. On the left shows the rates of diabetes across different populations in the United States. You can see around 8% of white non-Hispanic people have diabetes, but for people of American Indian, Hispanic, or black ancestry, it's almost double, somewhere around 13 or 14%, much higher prevalence. The other major disparity is by income. If you look at the graph on the right, you can see as people have lower education levels, their diabetes prevalence increases quite substantially. If we zoom out to worldwide prevalence, in 2014, 442 million people had type 2 diabetes. This is an increase of fourfold since 1980, and these numbers have continued to increase since 2014. Now, this is a combination of two factors. The first is, much like America, obesity rates have increased in almost every country in the world. But even worse, in some of these countries, particularly people of South Asian ancestry, there's a much stronger relationship between obesity and diabetes risk. Each line is a different ethnicity in America, comparing their BMI to the incidence of type 2 diabetes. The horizontal line is 10% diabetes incidence. If we look at a white population, shown here in the red line, you can see that 10% diabetes incidence that occurs at about a BMI of 30. However, if you look at a black population, that goes down to a BMI of about 28. That means you have the same likelihood of diabetes at less levels of obesity. People of South Asian ancestry have similar incidence of diabetes to people of white ancestry, 
at a BMI of only 24. This is less than what we would consider the cutoff for overweight. This is part of the reason by which different ethnic groups have higher rates of diabetes, even if their obesity rates are not higher. This also highlights the idea that we should take ethnicity into account when we set cutoffs for BMI to diabetes relationships. So let's talk about how insulin resistance and diabetes progresses over time. Blood glucose has to be maintained within a narrow range. Blood glucose is provided by dietary carbohydrates and by liver production through gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Several tissues use blood glucose, but after a meal, the major disposal tissue is muscle. As blood glucose levels rise, insulin levels rise, which then suppresses glucose production and promotes glucose disposal. This homeostasis by which glucose signals to insulin, which then signals to reduce blood glucose levels, keeps blood glucose levels in control in healthy individuals. However, in people with obesity or lipodystrophy, there can be insulin resistance. What that means is now insulin is less able to suppress gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, and also less able to promote glucose uptake in muscle. So as insulin resistance increases, glucose uptake decreases, and glycogenolysis increases. That means blood glucose levels will stay high, which will then signal to release more insulin. This cycle will continue. As insulin levels increase, insulin resistance increases, which means that more insulin needs to be produced. As this continues, Insulin is less and less able to promote glucose disposal and to suppress glucose production. In summary, what happens is you have excess weight, which then results in insulin resistance, meaning tissues respond worse to insulin. In response, our body makes more insulin to keep blood glucose at a normal range. However, insulin secretion is associated with more insulin resistance. And there's this arms race where insulin resistance keeps increasing and insulin production keeps increasing to match it. This can't continue indefinitely. And at some point, the pancreatic beta cells cannot produce enough insulin to maintain blood glucose. Now glucose levels are not able to be controlled and will rise. So what has genetics taught us about diabetes? In addition to the heritability studies I discussed before, genome-wide association studies have identified more than 400 individual diabetes risk alleles. These are shown on the right in this Manhattan plot. These alleles can be combined to generate a polygenic risk score. If you include age, sex, and BMI, these risk scores are about 70 to 80% accurate in predicting whether or not somebody will get diabetes. But what are these alleles actually doing? If you look at the graph in the bottom, and you look at where these alleles affect gene expression, you can see that most GWAS diabetes alleles affect gene expression in the beta cell of the pancreas. This means that the ability of the beta cell to continue compensating and producing insulin is critical to the genetic risk of diabetes. If you look at diabetes risk independent of obesity, so for example, if you look at populations of people who have the same obesity rates but have differential risk of diabetes, those alleles, rather than being enriched in the pancreas, tend to be enriched in adipose tissue. In summary, diabetes is a growing and devastating health epidemic, both in America and worldwide. It results from a progressively increased insulin resistance, impaired glucose disposal, and the inability to suppress glucose production. There are important social disparities in diabetes across ethnic groups. Now, some of this is partially explained by the differences in BMI to diabetes relationships across ethnic groups, but certainly that's not all of it. There's still much we have to learn about what is causing these socioeconomic disparities in diabetes rates.